Welcome alumni, emeritus and retired faculty and staff, current students, faculty and staff, and community partners to our Friends of the 50th celebration. My name is Kevin Eckert, and I'm honored to serve as chair of this amazing department and to share with you several highlights of its evolution over its first 50 years. First, however, I want to invite the Dean of the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences, Scott Casper, to welcome you. Scott? Thanks, Kevin. On behalf of UMBC and the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences, welcome or welcome back. We are delighted that you are here to celebrate UMBC's 50th anniversary with us. Depending on when you graduated from UMBC, if you are one of our alumni, the place may look different from when, but from when you were here. Uh, from new buildings to the number of students on campus, we have changed quite a bit. Uh, we now have at UMBC almost 14,000 students, about 11,000 undergraduates, almost 3,000 graduate students. Uh, one of the things that has not changed is our commitment to a fantastic, innovative education for our students. In fact, just this week, the university was named again to one of the top five, as one of the top five innovative universities in the United States by U.S. News and World Report, as well as being yay, as well as being <laughs> in the top 20 nationally for undergraduate education. Really remarkable for a university that is only 50 years old to achieve that kind of national recognition. And it's worth saying, it's really important to say, I'm sure Kevin will, will tell you more about this, the UMBC Department of Sociology, Anthropology, and Health Administration and Policy, and the doctoral program in gerontology really exemplify those strengths of UMBC, those hallmarks of UMBC. Students in these programs learn not only the theory and the subject matter of their fields, but also how to put that learning into practice. This is a remarkably broad department. As its brand new name, the Department of Sociology, Anthropology, and Health Administration and Policy suggests, the, the faculty in this department cover a wide range of topics, but what's remarkable about the department is how they find common ground across these very different disciplinary fields. In the study of health across the life course, in the study of diversity and gender and equity, and also in the tools of applied social science research. There are things that bridge and bring together the worlds of policy research, anthropology, and sociology. And many of the students in this program, including every student in the HAP program, Health Administration and Policy, pursue internships. Others pursue study abroad, including through the International Field Research Program. The department is also the home to UMBC's Center for Aging Studies, which for many years has done remarkable work funded by grants from the National Institutes of Aging and the National Institutes of Health on aging and now also issues of health across the life course. The gerontology doctoral program is really, I think, one of the best examples we have of the partnerships between our university and the University of Maryland, Baltimore. It's a joint doctoral program, as many of you know, between the two universities. It has been successful for more than 15 years now, thanks to the dedication of faculty members at both institutions, led by Leslie Morgan, uh, and, and really, created a program that is quite unusual nationally. There are, there's only a, there are only a handful of doctoral programs nationally in gerontology, and ours is one of them. The faculty in this department are known for both their innovative teaching and exciting research. Four of them are fellows of the Gerontolo Gerontological Society of America, which is the highest recognition in that field. Faculty members in this department, I will also say, have long been some of the most exemplary citizens of our entire university. We have at this university faculty members who have led in the faculty senate, who have led in the college, who have really participated in the full life of this university. So it's a department that is central to our students' learning, to our university's life, and it is a delight 
to celebrate the 50th anniversary with the Department of Sociology, Anthropology, and Health Administration and Policy, and the doctoral program in Gerontology. Try saying that quickly three times. Welcome or welcome back to UMBC. I hope you enjoy the evening and the festivities of this 50th anniversary weekend. Thank you. Since my time is brief this afternoon, my comments will highlight the development, wow, that sun is really strong, it's like this, will highlight um, the development of our academic programs, important affiliations, and our impact on UMBC and the community more broadly. These accomplishments are selective and provide only a snapshot of our many achievements and contributions during this period. I also, as a caveat, want to say that some of the dates early on, I've been told, may not be exactly correct, and Bill and Fred can correct that as we go along. As a founding major at UMBC in 1966, sociology offered its first course and was among a small group of majors offered in the Division of Social Sciences. Three years later, in 1969, the Department of Sociology was founded. At the same time, the department offered the first course in anthropology within the sociology major, within the sociology major. In 1972, the department faculty played an important role in the founding of the graduate program in policy sciences, thereby establishing the strong affiliation with that program that continues to the present. 1975, marks a banner year for the department with the creation of the master's program in applied sociology. As, form, as a former director of the program, Bill Rostein will have some more to say about that program in his comments today. Continuing with our history of academic program development, in 1978, the now Health Administration and Policy Program was approved as a major within the department. At that time, the program was called Health Science and Policy. Another development, especially important to the management of our federally funded grants, was the establishment of the Maryland Institute for Policy Analysis and Research in 1982. Research conducted by department faculty comprised a major segment of the portion or the, of the portfolio of grants that MIPAR currently manages. In 1987, rather than a track within the sociology major, anthropology was offered as a minor. A year later, in 1988, the department's name change was expanded to the Department of Sociology and Anthropology. That was in 1988. While the department's programs continued to expand, the faculty also continued to play important roles in the development of affiliated programs. Thus, in 1998, the doctoral program in language, literacy, and culture was created with the involvement of our faculty on committees, mentoring students, and teaching courses. In 2000, anthropology became a freestanding major. Also in 2000, health science and policy was renamed health administration and policy comprised of two tracks, health administration and health policy. A few years later, <clears throat> in 2001, the interdisciplinary bi-campus UMB, UMBC doctoral program in gerontology was created, co-directed by one of our full-time faculty members with offices located in our department, and you will hear more about that uh, later in the program. That same year, the Departmental Center for Aging Studies was established. To date, 20 separate NIH, NIA grants have been awarded totaling nearly $21 million. These projects have provided important financial support for graduate students, faculty scholarships, and career development. In 2003, the Policy Sciences Doctoral Program that we've been affiliated with for so many years became a Department of Public Policy. Then, in 2004, department faculty played a founding role in the establishment of the Erickson School of Aging Studies one of the few professional schools nationally with a focus on preparation of undergraduates and graduate students for careers in the management of aging services. Also in 2004, 
the department established the post-baccalaureate nonprofit certificate that expanded the mission of the applied master's program. 2007 was a landmark year for the health administration and for health administration and policy with the addition of a third track in public health that dramatically expanded the number of majors in the program and made the case for expanding the number of program faculty to keep pace with student demands. Among our affiliated programs, a recent major development is the Department of Public Policy became a school of public policy within the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences. Thus, the first 50 years have seen a remarkable evolution of majors, programs, affiliations, initiatives from faculty and staff in the department. We can now officially call, if you all want to repeat after me, <laughs> the Department of Sociology, Anthropology, and Health Administration and Policy. A department with 22 full-time teaching and research faculty, 24 adjunct faculty, some teaching in the department for over 30 years. Paul, where are you? Paul, thank you very much. 592 majors and 177 minors across our three undergraduate programs, 41 students in the master's program, five wonderful, spectacular administrative staff. Please raise your hands. Absolutely remarkable. And over 3,500 alumni, many of whom have donated time and money to support our programs. We thank you, thank you, thank you. Our story has been written through the hard work of faculty, staff, students, and friends who support our mission. To provide undergraduates a solid background in our respective disciplines, to develop new knowledge through scholarship and research, and to serve the university professions and the broader community. I want to thank you all for contributing to the writing of our ongoing amazing story. Thank you. Now we're going to have a real treat for you. We have two of our emeritus faculty here this evening to speak for a bit about their about UMBC, reflect on UMBC and their time here. I'm pleased to introduce Bill, you're going to go first. Dr. Bill Rothstein, Professor Emeritus. Bill joined where are you going? Oh, okay, don't go away. Don't go away. Bill joined UMBC in 1966. He literally opened the doors, uh, or was here when UMBC opened the doors. He retired in June 20, uh, 2013. Um, Bill, I believe you're gonna come in on those early years and the development of the master's program and the health and aging focus over time. There you go. Thank you. Uh, I'm Bill Rothstein, obviously. Uh, I was professor of sociology and director of the MA program in applied sociology. I'm going to talk mostly about the health and aging programs, and Dr. Pincus will be creative and talk about other things. <laughs> when I took a position with UMBC in its first year in 1966, uh, I drove to Baltimore in May to find housing. I wanted to see the campus and drove out Wilkins Avenue past the cows and the dairy, um, which made me think twice about this so-called urban university. I took a right turn and ended up at Spring Grove State Mental Hospital, <laughs> which did not seem like a new university, especially the bars on the windows. I drove back to Wilkins and took a left uh, there. I drove to the top of the hill, got out of the car, and looked down. There are big piles of dirt everywhere, three unfinished buildings, and no roads. I couldn't believe that they could, they could open in a few months. Would I have a job if they couldn't? They did open on time, but we were not ready. I was the only faculty member in the department, and we had one course, Introduction to Sociology. <laughs> I told the head of the social science division that I had never taken or taught the course. <laughs> and he said, don't worry about it. <laughs> so we had one course 
and one faculty member who had never taken or taught the course. The early years of the department were spent deciding what courses to teach and hiring faculty to teach them. We decided to have a course on race relations and hire Dr. Pincus. We decided to have a course on something else and hired that person. There was no focus or direction to the courses. We just added them for no good reason. <laughs> the result was that the faculty did not have any shared interests, and this was a source of dissatisfaction for some of them. We established requirements for the major, including required methods and statistics courses, but we had great difficulty finding faculty to teach statistics. In the 1970s, we started thinking about having a focus in the department because the administration wanted to add graduate programs. Our idea was to develop a master's program, but the Maryland Higher Education Commission wanted to, to avoid duplication of academic programs, and College Park already had a sociology graduate program. The other issue was finding students. Social Security was nearby, and some of their employees might want MA degrees. So we called it an MA in Applied Sociology to differentiate it from College Park and focus on health and aging to attract Social Security employees. We submitted it to the Maryland Higher Education Commission, and the staff rejected it. I phoned one of them, and I asked why. He said it was the cost of the building. I said, we didn't ask for a building. <laughs> he said, no, but you will later. <laughs> I convinced him to drop their objection, and we met with the commission. The commission members were very enthusiastic about the health and aging focus, which was quite new in higher education. We never realized that we were being innovative. The MA program never attracted workers from Social Security, but it gradually attracted many UMBC students who were able to take several graduate courses in their senior year and count them for both the BA and the MA degrees. They spread the word to other students in the Baltimore, Washington area. At one time, we graduated more students every year than any other MA-only program in the country, and the program was featured in a publication of the American Sociological Association. We developed a four-course certificate in the nonprofit sector. It was also innovative and successful and could have been an important program if we had the resources. Our faculty teaching the nonprofit courses were all professionals in the field, and I really think they got an excellent education on how to work in and run a nonprofit organization. I really regret we never uh, developed that into a degree program. Uh, many of our graduate students have written impressive research papers on current issues in health and aging, and several of them have been published in scholarly journals. Our graduates have taken positions in many public, nonprofit, and private organizations. Some have been promoted to high-level administrative positions. In the 1970s also, the UMBC administration decided to create a program <coughs> to prepare students for non-clinical careers in the health industry. It was put in our department because of the medical sociology courses already being taught by our faculty. We had not anticipated this benefit of our MA program. The person hired to start it was a professional health administrator, not an academic, and that was the focus of the program. The new major, now called Health Administration and Policy, began in September 1978. Several tracks, including public health and health services administration. Courses have been taught by adjunct faculty or health professionals with important positions in the field. The program has become extremely popular, requires an internship, and students have been at the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, the State Health Department, the State Department of Aging, the Health Departments in Howard County and Baltimore City, and Johns Hopkins Medical School, among others. 
Their jobs after graduation include Blue Cross Blue Shield, the Federal Government Center for Disease Control, MedStar, and private businesses such as Lockheed Martin. You can see this has been a very successful academic program. The health and aging focus was strengthened again in the late 1990s when a group of faculty with research interests in aging at UMBC and the University of Maryland, Baltimore, developed a joint gerontology doctoral program. The department had discussed extending the MA program to include a PhD program, but decided it was not feasible, so this was a welcome addition. The gerontology program was interdisciplinary, involved faculty and courses from both campuses. The faculty focus at UMBC has always been among sociologists and anthropologists, while at UMB, UMB most schools participate, but especially epidemiology. The program administered its first students in 2001 and is now celebrating 15 years with 35 alumni and counting who work in academe, government, and both for-profit and non-profit organizations. The hiring of Professor Rubenstein led to the establishment of the Center on Aging Study, which employs some gerontology PhD students. Its current research is on long-term care, including projects on adult day services, urban experiences of type 2 diabetes patients, and optimal care of people with dementia. More than 20 multi-year studies totaling more than $20 million in funding have been conducted since 1997. We deeply regret that Dr. Rubenstein is ill and cannot be here. All of us wish him a speedy recovery. These programs that demonstrate the department focus on two of the most important public issues, health and aging. I was interviewed several years ago by a graduate student who was doing research on the UMBC social sciences departments to assist a faculty member who was writing a history of UMBC, which I believe may have been completed. The student told me that he thought our department was the most impressive social science department because of the programs I've just described. These programs have a coherence and direction that he did not find in the other departments. The department is, of course, much broader in the, than the fields of health and aging. It has always emphasized the needs of undergraduates by providing courses and faculty members in the major areas of sociology and anthropology. From the beginning of the department, we recruited faculty members with diverse interests, and many, including myself, have had one foot in sociology or anthropology, and one foot in another discipline. I've always believed that this provides students with a broader perspective than faculty members who focus on narrow areas of sociology or anthropology. I now give you another retired faculty member from the early years of the campus, Professor Fred Pincus. The two of us cheated by meeting in advance and dividing up topics for to discuss. <laughs> I took the I took, I took clearly focused topics that are easy to summarize. I do not regret it. <laughs> uh, thank you, Bill. Uh, interestingly enough, I came in 1968 when I was uh, just around my 28th birthday. I was hired as an instructor at $9,500 a year. Uh, which was considered not too bad then, uh, and I was finishing up my dissertation. Interestingly enough, uh, when I came two years after Bill, as I was driving up, I couldn't quite remember what exit from the Beltway to take. And so I knew it was Catonsville, and I exited Catonsville and kind of went in and stopped at the first gas station and said, uh, could you tell me where UMBC is? And the guy said, what? <laughs> I said, UMBC, University of Maryland, Baltimore County. He said, I don't know. Uh, I've lived here all my life, and I don't know where it is. And so I, I drove down to the next gas station, who fortunately uh, pointed me in the right direction. Uh, as uh, Bill was saying, uh, when I came, there were three of us. There was him, myself, and James Conrad, who was an anthropologist. 
Uh, the, the division head, Dave Lewis, was also a sociologist who taught a couple of courses. And then we had an adjunct that came the same time as me, Alan Kors, who taught one cl class a semester for about 40 years uh, until he stopped. Pretty amazing. One of the fascinating things about coming here is, when I did, is we had no department traditions except for what each of us brought from our graduate school experience. So we could kind of decide how we wanted to run things. And we established a kind of democratic ethos where uh, we had to do things uh, consensually. Of course, there were only three of us. Uh, and the, uh, the coordinator who was the, we didn't have chairs then, we had coordinators who didn't have control over the budget. But the coordinator had one vote just like the rest of us. And we really kept that tradition. And of course, when we departmentalized, the chair had a bit more power. But I, I like to think that that democratic nature of things uh, really prevailed for most of my time at UMBC. We were also pluralistic in terms of uh, approaches to sociology, methodology, and, and so forth. And, and I think that has uh, also continued. Uh, the, the democratic ethos that I mentioned did have some blips. And I remember once in, 19, in the 1980s, uh, the then chair, who, who shall remain nameless, uh, decided uh, on his own to not renew the contract of an adjunct who taught the Sociology of Women course because he didn't think it was important. And a couple of us uh, challenged him. We had some very acrimonious meetings, but he had a back down. Uh, and so we saved this woman's job for a semester when, when he did it more according to procedure. Uh, this, uh, the 1960s and early 70s, of course, was a time of great political turmoil, both on and off campus. Uh, there was a lot of student radicals on campus, a lot of student protests about the Vietnam War, about racial inequality, about student power, and students having the right to select who their teachers were, and, uh, and so forth. Uh, it's also interesting to note that at that time, there were very few black students on campus, probably about 5% or so. I don't remember exactly. And I'm sorry? It was 2%. 2%. 2%, OK. Not surprised. <laughs> and, and one of the reasons was there was no public bus that came to campus. The bus stopped about a mile away. And that was a source of concern for uh, uh, not just the students, but a lot of other people. The faculty was young, liberal, and mainstream. Uh, we were all kind of upwardly mobile. Uh, most of us, this was our, our first jobs out of uh, graduate school. Uh, so when I came in 68, I found that there was no ROTC on campus. The faculty had voted not to have it. People who wanted ROTC had to go to Johns Hopkins University and participate there. I mean, they were students here, but they took ROTC there. There was also radical faculty activism on campus. Uh, there was a national organization that most people have never heard of called the New University Conference which was the adult version of the Students for Democratic Society. Uh, and it was really a lot of young faculty and uh, graduate students that participated. We had a chapter here. At its height, there were about 1,000 members around the country. Uh, but NUC was very active in a lot of things here. And I was uh, very involved in that. And there were a lot of conflicts between the liberal and radical faculty. Something probably doesn't happen today, but it was a big deal then. I remember, for example, in around 1970 or 71, teaching a interdisciplinary course on poverty, 
with uh, me, uh, a liberal historian, Aileen Austin, and a conservative economist, uh, Ed Dickey, who, who I think went from here to teach at, in the Defense Department somewhere. And uh, uh, the, the economists and I used to sort of gang up on the liberal. Uh, that's not proud of that, but that's what happened. <laughs> the first graduation was in 1970, in, in May. And it was a big deal. But the context was also interesting because uh, the graduation happened a few weeks after the killings at Kent State and Jackson State Universities. The students were up in arms, uh, uh, talking about striking and suspending final exams and, and so forth. And the faculty was told that if you don't show up to your classes, you're going to get fired. So one day, uh, I went to my class. Uh, I had actually told students that I have to teach, but if you don't come, I can't teach. So I did give them a little hint. But anyhow, there was an empty classroom. And I sat there fulfilling my contractual obligations, reading the insurgent sociologist, which was the main <laughs> radical sociology journal at the time. And the, uh, the vice chancellor came in uh, to make sure I was there. And he, he yelled at me and said, you did this. Uh, you know, you, you created, uh, you caused the students not to come. And so and I, I just shrugged and I said, you just can't control your students these days. <laughs> and uh, he left in a huff. Uh, but the, the graduation was very meaningful to me because uh, I had students in my classes that were there. I, I sort of helped build the university. And, um, but I did not want to wear a cap and gown. That was much too bourgeois for me at, at the time. But I did wear uh, a suit and tie, which I didn't wear very often. And uh, I was in the audience. Uh, and of course, I, I was standing next to some of the radical students who were my friends. Uh, and they were distributing a publication called The Red Brick. This was very controversial because it was a radical publication that was funded by the student government. Uh, people were throwing bricks through windows of banks and stuff like that, so you get the symbolism. And we happened to be standing, uh, it, it was in the quad, uh, right in front of where the faculty procession went. And I saw the faces of the faculty. They looked at the students and grimaced. They looked at the red brick and grimaced. And then they looked at me. <laughs> and, and the grimace turned to snarls. Uh, and, and I remember standing there thinking, oh my goodness, I would have been better off staying home. Will I ever get tenure? <laughs> um, in either my second or third year, I can't quite remember, Bill insisted that I become the coordinator of sociology. Again, coordinator was the, the, the paper pusher administrator at the time. So I said, OK, and found that I was just inundated with stuff, with uh, uh, committee meetings, other kind of meetings, uh, and memos and pieces of paper. Uh, this for, was pre-email. So if you could imagine getting all those emails in paper form in those intercampus envelopes, <laughs> it, it was quite something. Uh, also, I, I just was trying to keep my head above water. Uh, and I complained to one of the other coordinators in social science. And he smiled and said, it's good. It keeps you out of trouble. <laughs> that was his comment. Uh, and I recall one meeting in particular. We had a social science division meeting. And the discussion turned to where the, uh, how to control the radical students. And people were talking about what to do. And I, I felt, you know, talk about role conflict. I, I felt very uncomfortable. And then finally, I, I stood up and I said, listen, um, you know, you're talking about my friends and comrades out there. Uh, I can't agree to maintain the confidence of this meeting. So I'm just going to leave. And you can continue talking. 
Uh, again, uh, people were less than happy with me. Uh, I did come up for tenure in 1973. I had all of two publications, one uh, a co-authored book chapter with my dissertation advisor, and the second an upcoming article in none other than The Insurgent Sociologist. Uh, this today would be described as thin, <laughs> to say the least. However, at the time, uh, a few of us were, were able to get by uh, partly on that and committee work because we really spent a lot of time building the curriculum and so forth. And I fortunately had the support of my colleagues in, in the discipline. So I did get tenured, but I did not get promoted. So I was a tenured assistant professor, which lasted for another 20 years, but that's another story. Uh, one of the things, by the way, is that the, the, the vice chancellor who yelled at me he and the chancellor uh, left just before my tenure year, and the new people uh, came in, didn't really know me, and we hadn't had the animosity, so I was very fortunate. So I, I look back over those years with a lot of fondness because uh, there was a feeling among the faculty that we're, we were really together building this institution uh, uh, even when you disagreed with somebody, we still were kind of on the same team. Uh, the faculty senate actually made decisions that meant something uh, much more often than, uh, than uh, subsequently. I, I do remember some, uh, I guess in looking back, kind of uh, absurdities. Uh, uh, we had these vicious debates in the faculty senate about whether to cap enrollment at 15,000 or 25,000. Uh, and uh, I guess we're now at 14,000, uh, so that uh, we, we misread. Social scientists are not good at projecting sometimes. Uh, during one acrimonious debate about something, uh, the, the opposing side uh, invoked Roger, Robert's Rules of Order to, to kind of stop our discussion. And one of my NUC colleagues popped up and said, I moved to get rid of Robert's Rules of Order. <laughs> uh, we lost that one. Uh, then there was a time that students were, uh, came to a Senate meeting. And they were unhappy with what's going on. And the faculty were uh, bombarded with, mush uh, with um, marshmallows. And the following day, each faculty member had a marshmallow neatly balanced on their doorknob. Uh, and finally, I, I remember a discussion that I had with uh, some faculty members before we had African American studies on, on campus. Uh, again, in, in the 1970, 71, uh, really a lot of people felt that there was nothing called African American Studies. But we were talking, and, and I guess I said something like, I think all students should read uh, Malcolm X, the autobiography of Malcolm X, which had come out recently. And uh, a conservative uh, physicist looked at me and said, are you saying that students should read Malcolm X rather than Shakespeare? And I looked at him, and I said, yes. <laughs> And he was so upset that he just got up and left. Now, of course, what I should have said is that they should read both, which is what I'd say in, uh, now. So uh, uh, again, I, I have very fond feelings. And uh, that's how UMBC began. <laughs> It really is wonderful to have sort of our past put in context or it, it, for us to see, you know, we've evolved, but it's really important to know what it was like in the 60s and 70s. Two themes I want to pick up on, one bill, one theme of bills and one theme of yours. The whole theme related to the democratic uh, involvement of the faculty has continued. What you started continues today. We have a constitution and really 
It's the role of the faculty in terms of what we do as a department. The second theme is Bill's theme, and that is where you, the focus, the focus side that you started in health and aging certainly have continued and flourished over the course of the past 50 years. So where you started 50 years ago, 45 years ago, go on today. And we thank you for your contribution. It's fantastic you're here and can be here to share this with us this evening. Thank you so much. With that, I'd like to segue to the next part of our program. And I'm going to hand the mic over to John Schumacher, who is professor in our department and co-director of the doctoral program in gerontology. John. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks. Let me grab something here. Thanks, everyone. Welcome. It's uh, great to see a, a huge crowd here. Um, I hope you're uh, having a chance to talk to each other, um, eat, uh, drink, be merry. Um, this part of the program, we are recognizing uh, Leslie Morgan. Uh, I'm the current one-month-old co-director of the 15-year-old gerontology uh, doctoral program, and uh, Leslie was my predecessor. Uh, so what we want to do is uh, spend a little bit of time recognizing her contributions. Um, to that program and its growth. So again, uh, the gerontology program is 15 years old, so that means that UMBC, it emerged from UMBC when UMBC was 35. Um, and um, Leslie uh, has been with the department and the, the program since 1976, I believe? Yeah. 79, 79. Um, so uh, she's uh, been part of the gerontology program for 12 years. And um, with that, we want to do a little bit of a kind of life course perspective, kind of looking back uh, <laughs> of, the, of the history. And um, uh, I, I'll start the life course history with it that, that Leslie started her uh, work with the gerontology program uh, in uh, 2003. She was an interim director. And to show you some of the collegiality, she was stepping in for Kevin Eckert, who was the uh, first director, and uh, he had a well deserved sabbatical. So Leslie collegially stepped up and was the the director of this program that was two years old. So, so again, imagine life course, a two-year-old running around. Leslie is uh, jumping into that and saying, okay, I need to set some limits to this two-year-old. We need to talk about boundaries. Um, <laughs> and, uh, so she, she uh, performed that role for a year. Uh, two years later, she came back when the program was four years old uh, and became the, uh, the second director of the program. So again, Leslie, during the preschool years, uh, began with this uh, four-year-old doctoral program and, uh, and then has been with that program all the way until now when it is 15 years old, a precocious teenager, you may say. <laughs> uh, and, and I want to invite Kevin Eckerd to come up, uh, the first director of the gerontology program, to give us a little bit more history of what, what that was like, what was the, the development of the gerontology program. Um, and then I'll invite some people up to, to say some words about Leslie's role in this over the past uh, 12 years. So, Kevin. Thank you, John. Well, of course, it's really an honor to say a few words about Leslie, my friend and colleague for 30 years. Uh, I came here in January 1987, and Leslie was among the first people I met. And in meeting Leslie, I, uh, I, had, I had my doubts whether I'd made the right decision in coming to UMBC, but once I met Leslie, I was convinced I had made the correct decision. And I say that because no sooner did I get here than Leslie and I began to talk about research. I had an R01 grant that I brought here with me, and Leslie, we began talking about research, and I got very excited. So Leslie and I, at that time, 30 years ago, 31 years ago, began our collaboration in research, in publishing together, in mentoring students in policy sciences at the time who were interested in health and aging. We didn't have the doctoral program, so we were mentoring students in public policy, in policy sciences, that was, was its name at the time, who were interested in health and aging. And Stephanie was here, one of our students, and is Donna Cox here? Donna, I saw her name on, but... But so the students initially who were interested in health and aging were really in the public policy program, policy sciences. As those years progressed, we, we continued to work on our research and we also worked with our friends at UMB. And in that process of research, working together, there was this natural synergy and we began to brainstorm about the creation of an interdisciplinary doctoral program focusing on aging. 
When Scott Bass, who was the former director of the doctoral program in gerontology at UMass Boston, joined UMBC as dean of the graduate school and a member of our department, the effort to create a doctoral program uh, really accelerated. We all were very excited. As you might know, Leslie was instrumental in the development of the doctoral program, along with Scott Bass and me at UMBC, and Jay Magaziner, where's Jay? Jay? He was here. Along with Jay Magaziner and Joanne Boffman at UMB. This was an especially exciting time for Jay, Leslie, and me as we crafted the interdisciplinary and multi-campus program, embracing the expertise across the two campuses. UMBC was responsible for developing the social, cultural, behavioral, and policy elements of the curriculum, while UMB handled, as Bill mentioned, the epidemiology and population health elements. As a formally trained sociologist, social gerontologist, from University of Southern California's renowned Ethel Percy Andrews School, Leslie, perhaps more than any of us, provided the valuable guidance for the unique and very special program we see today. I think it's fair to say that you, Leslie, and the topics covered in the socio-cultural elements of the program have been significantly influenced by you and your superb textbook, Aging Society in the Life Course, co-authored with Suzanne Kunkel, in its, now in its fifth edition. That, that gives you an idea of the caliber of the faculty we've had in this program with Leslie's leadership and the social cultural. She writes the textbooks, and we've had her guiding this program and teaching our students over the life of this program. Her skillful teaching of core courses in the program, supporting and mentoring students. I've been on many committees with Leslie. I know what a spectacular mentor she is. You do a spectacular job, and we all learn from what you do. And her strong advocacy for gerontology on this campus at UMB and nationally. Le Leslie is a leader nationally in the development of gerontology. She's a fellow of the Association for Gerontology and Higher Education, among other things, and a leader in that, in that national association. I could say so, so much more about Leslie over the past 30 years of our friendship and collaborations on program development, mentoring, conducting research, publishing, and coping with life's vicissitudes, which we've done through time. We've often go in each other's office, close the door, and let our hair down and talk about, you know, the, the curveballs that life throws you. But I'm going to save more of those comments, Leslie, for your retirement. <laughs> so watch out, OK? So watch out. More to come. So I would like to hand this back to you, John, and to anyone else. Sure. Um, so I just want to go back to um, the story when Leslie began the program. Remember this four-year-old uh, preschool? Uh, the program in 2005 when Leslie started had zero graduates. It started in 2001. Um, it currently has 35 graduates. Um, so big hand for the zero program. Um, so again, under uh, Leslie's uh, leadership, uh, zero to 35. Um, also, would like to point out that the graduation rate for our doctoral students uh, is above 72% compared to 55% nationally. Another big hand for the program. <laughs> this has been done with uh, zero faculty lines. Another big hand. Oh, wait, no. <laughs> uh, and, and I say that because um, that's a testament, again, to Leslie and her leadership and her collaboration. Right? She's uh, been able to make this program work. Um, on a shoestring. Uh, she's been able to um, get faculty to teach, to recruit students, um, and, and, and that's a, a really a testament here. Um, we, we would like to thank uh, Dean Casper, who uh, just this year has uh, authorized a halftime uh, line for the sociology and gerontology program. So, so we will be getting some relief. So we, we thank Dean Casper for that. that. Let's applaud that. I will throw in, if we project that out, in 120 years, we'll have four faculty members. <laughs> but, but we'll try to accelerate that growth. 120 years, the lifespan. Anyway, um, but uh, again, Leslie's enjoying all this focus because you all know that she uh, likes to be the center of attention. Um, 
And, uh, uh, and then that does point to her graciousness. Uh, so something I've recognized in her is, is graciousness. Um, that's a characteristic, being a team player, being willing to step up and, uh, and do what needs to be done. So, so I, I thank her for that on behalf of the program uh, and the faculty. Um, so at this point, there's a, a number of people who want to say some words uh, to, again, recognize Les's contribution. Um, so I want to ask uh, the dean of our graduate school, uh, Janet Rutledge, uh, to come up and uh, she'd like to speak uh, to us. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you for letting me be part of your program. It's been um, quite uh, educational to hear the history of the department and reflecting on that, thinking about how closely it mirrors the story of UMBC. And, you know, it's really the story of a group of dedicated people committed to building something great. And, you know, I, I think that if you look over the years, and look at the people in this room, you see some people who are wonderful university citizens. And I can't think of anybody besides Leslie Morgan who um, is an example of that. I came to UMBC in 2001, and you know, when, when Leslie told me that she was stepping down as the GPD of gerontology, I said, oh, you've been GPD since the start, and she said, no, I haven't. And, we went back and, and looked at everything, and I, and I realized that Leslie had been in and out and in and out so many times in, um, between gerontology and sociology um, that it seemed like she was always a part of the leadership of graduate education at UMBC. And there's a lot of people that know her better, but one of the things that, that um, I want to share, you know, so people who have heard Freeman Rabowski speak, one of the things that he likes to say uh, um, is that his mother always, um, uh, maybe it was his uh, friend, uh, who uh, um, always wanted to know, did you ask a good question today? And one of the things that um, has been a hallmark of my relationship with Leslie is she asks really good questions. And a lot of the times, I didn't have an answer. <laughs> and it took a lot to figure out how to answer the question. But in every single case, it was something that made graduate education better because it was a question that needed to be asked and it was a question that needed to be answered. Um, so for that, Leslie, we thank you for all of graduate education at UMBC. And, and, yes. and you know, as, as I was reflecting on what a small group of people have done, and what a wonderful legacy you have left. Um, I couldn't help but notice how appropriate it was to be standing next to this quote, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. And that's what um, you have done in this department, and that's what you have done, um, Leslie Morgan. And, and I'm proud to have worked with you. So next we have uh, Justine Golden, who has also uh, been with the program all 15 years. Uh, so we thank you for your, your service. Um, you. We also send greetings from our co-director, uh, Denise Orwig, who uh, was not able to be here because she's uh, with her sibling, her twin brother, celebrating her 50th birthday. So we'll forever know how old Denise is because we know how old <laughs> you'll be seeing. Um, but and she does uh, send her greetings uh, also. And then, uh, Justine will uh, we'll read some greetings from uh, Denise and um, some up. We, we invite some people to send in some, uh, some messages about, uh, about Leslie and, and here's Justine. Yes, I will start with Denise uh, Orwig's statement. Denise is still co-director at the UMB side. She has worked with Leslie for many years uh, and is now will be working with John. So Denise says, I'm sorry that I cannot be there to celebrate the program's 15th and UMBC's 50th and Leslie's Mor uh, Leslie Morgan's leadership. I cannot think of a better representation of the successful culmination of each than to feature the accomplishments of three of our esteemed alumni. As a young researcher starting my own career, that'd be Denise's, I was very fortunate to have access to iconic role models for interdisciplinary gerontology research like J Magaziner, Kevin Eckert, and Leslie. It was exciting to be involved in the development of the doctoral program with these great researchers and watch it grow under the leadership. First Jay and Kevin, and then Jay and Leslie. 
I was so nervous when I agreed to take over as co-director. I remember saying to Leslie at the time that I did not think I knew anything about directing a doctoral program, and she laughed and said, no one does. <laughs> it has been a true honor co-directing the program with Leslie over the past several years. The program, students, and faculty have benefited from Leslie's leadership. She has a way of instilling confidence in others, inspiring you to be your best, and always seeing the possibilities. There is not enough time to list all that I've learned from working with Leslie, but suffice it to say that I am far better, I am a far better leader, gerontologist, mentor, and collaborator because of it. So that's Denise. <laughs> I just have a few, but I am going to continue. Lynn Fisher has says, she uh, wrote in, thank you, Leslie, for all the wisdom you imparted uh, in our theories and methods professor in gerontology and for setting such a strong example professionally to those of us who have the pleasure of working with you in the Center for Aging Studies. I still refer to the criteria we use to critique research articles in GERO 750 and 751. From you, I learned to think and write with greater precision and to evaluate critically every research report and journal article I see. Your unflappable manner and dedication to excellence have inspired me and countless students and researchers. Next is from Israel Cross. Uh, he says, good afternoon from the Great Plains on the Winnebago Reservation in Nebraska. <laughs> Uh, I, I regret that I am unable to attend today, but I wish you all the best in your transition. I'll never forget Lives in Time and Place, good, that makes sense to you, uh, by Sutterston, and your infamous markups on our research proposal asking why, why, but why. <laughs> You've played a critical role in developing my abilities to analyze and think critically. For this, I will forever be in your debt. Second to last, uh, Jamila Terrain said, Dr. Morgan is definitely someone I look up to both academically and personally. She is so passionate about the field. Her excitement inspires students and motivates us to work hard. Dr. Morgan always goes above and beyond for her students. When I was taking Jero 751, she broke her nose while walking her dog. <laughs> the day of, the, she did it the day of individual presentations. Uh, so, she, but she was still determined to give feedback. So she called in and listened to the students give their presentations. She took notes and still gave them feedback. During the development of their proposal, she met with uh, Jamila in person and she allowed her to call. Oh, Jamila could call your house to ask for uh, feedback. And she just says that your dedication impresses her and uh, it's professors like you that keep her motivated. Thanks, Dr. Morgan, we will miss you. I'm sorry she couldn't be here. So that's what was sent in. My own words, because I have worked with you really for 15 years, very directly for 12, that I'm very lucky to uh, have had you as one of my wonderful co-directors. But it has been 12 years for us. Uh, you, you were and are a pleasure to work with. Uh, you're always willing to pitch in. You've opened your home many times. You've played games. You've, you've cooked food, and of course, your leadership has been amazing. And you're always at ease. You've always been able to be a calming influence. And my favorite part, Leslie has a quick response. She gets back to you. The great behavior to have. I appreciate it. <laughs> so with that, I will miss you, but I do look forward to working with you, John. So do you want to continue? Thanks. Um, so, so this time we want to give uh, a couple of people if you'd like to say uh, any words uh, to Leslie on, on her transition um, from the Jiro program. I, I open that up for a moment or two. Go ahead. Um, so Leslie and I started working together before the Jiro program. We were on the collaborative studies of long-term care. Ooh, and we got to go to North Carolina and all kinds of other places for that. Um, I did that, I think I was even still a research associate at the time, and I was the big geeky data analyst. And we had a lot of great discussions about qualitative, quantitative theory, the methods within the context of assisted living. And again, Leslie is always a very, very um, theory rich, very, but very um, practical person when you talk to her. I mean, I just sort of could see the 
think about it. It's this realistic kind of thing coming out of my mind when I think of Leslie. Um, and then similarly, as we transitioned into the gerontology doctor program, um, I served for many years with her on the comps committee, which is lots of fun. And um, again, the idea of critiquing and trying to really develop questions that are appropriate for students, and really, again, being reasonable, but being um, having good high quality. And so that good balance. And again, Leslie works very well with the students. And again, the first doctoral dissertation I was on was one that you led, it was Elzbietism. And so, um, again, seeing her leadership in her way that she mentored people, and I will always remember that, and you'll miss that. Um, so the steady hand, the reasonable approach. Um, but the thing that I will miss most about Leslie is games. So as part of our gerontology doctoral program, we have a game night, and Leslie always brings in, what was it, Apples Tapples, and some of the Pictionary games, and I can just, see her enjoying it, laughing it, being involved, having a real personal relationship with all of us, and the picnics. And she does a mean hula. And now she wants to do this is a real good model of successful aging. And I will miss our lifespan versus life course and all kinds of other fun discussions. And we'll see you around and we'll, and we'll talk about Ohio too. So, okay. So, My name is Rosalind Chester, and on behalf of many students that have come under tutelage and love of uh, Dr. Leslie Morgan, I just want to say uh, from the class of 84, we love you, and um, wherever they all are <laughs> in their old age. Um, a few minutes ago, uh, when I passed by, I held up to Leslie something, and she read it very quickly and said, oh, that's nice. <laughs> I don't think she realized that what I showed her was my thesis. Oh, well, well, <laughs> <laughs> and I remember the days of uh, coming to her office and shaking, and I had to do now. <laughs> but uh, I will never forget you, and I'm glad I had this opportunity. Hi, my name is Michael Sterling, a graduate of 1985. Dr. Morgan was my advisor uh, when I was here. And I just happened to walk in the door and just get just a little bit of everything that was being stated. But as an African American coming here in 1980, Dr. Morgan really took time with me. I'm from originally from Eastern Shore. Crystal High School. But she took time with me and advised me into something I'll never forget. If it wasn't for her, especially in my last two years here at UBC, I would never have gotten out. So I just wanted to say thank you very much. And I'm glad I came in just at the time and had an opportunity to say something. <laughs> So I didn't have the honor of working with you in the gerontology program, but you did get my interest in aging studies, and you said you are going to your PhD. I did. So you're the reason I got my PhD in okay. College Park. And part of the reason that I came back to UMBC, because you made it a very welcoming place. So I've worked at UMBC for 18 years, and started in the Institutional Research Office and now an Associate Vice Provost of Institutional Research. And I, a lot of what I learned and a lot of what I still utilize, I attribute to you, so thank you. So we'll have one last uh, comment. Uh, I'm Jay Magaziner, and um, I, I met Leslie um, long before the gerontology doctoral program began. And I remember one of the, we used to talk about, there were very few of us doing work in aging. I guess I didn't realize that there was an aging and health initiative even before in the 70s. Um, I don't know if that continued, but I came into it when I joined the University of Maryland in Baltimore, and I sought out people who were doing work in aging. And I remember coming first to Leslie. Kevin wasn't here yet. Bob Rubenstein wasn't here yet. And Leslie and I used to talk because we had some very 
um, common interests in sociology and life course issues and aging. And I remember going to dinner with you with Ethel Seamus. Do you remember that? Well, way back, and we had, a, I think you had, did you work with her? Not really, no. Not really, but you, Second. So, well, we had a nice dinner together. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember that. I remember many discussions, and Leslie and Kevin and I um, working with, um, I guess it was Scott Bass and a couple of other others at the Baltimore campus, and maybe one or two here. Um, we really, we worked for three years. I don't know if you mentioned that, Kevin. We worked three years. It was three years. We worked for three years to develop the curriculum and navigate the intercampus dynamics of putting on a program. Um, unfortunately, I'm, I'm sorry to say those same dynamics still exist, and um, not among us by any means. But in putting programs together that cross campuses, we still haven't broken out of that, and I think that's unfortunate. But we broke out of it because we were all very committed to it. And I think Leslie was always at the table. Um, she always had some value to add to the discussion, um, bringing a real sociological perspective to it. Kevin brought anthropology. I brought um, epidemiology and some other social science. And it was really quite a, quite a genuine um, relationship that developed there out of that. Um, and I also had the pleasure of leading the program with you um, after Kevin um, decided he was going to do something else. Um, and it's been just a wonderful time working with you. And I don't think the program would be anything like it is today and successful without the stability and the drive that you've mm -hmm. just brought to it with the background. You've always coached in the background, mm -hmm. but you've kept it moving. Thank you, Leslie. Right. So uh, in recognition of uh, Leslie's 12 years, uh, we were thinking about, well, what would be a fitting memento? Um, you know, should we get her a paperweight? Uh, and, and we said, well, look, this is a person who successfully ages. This is a person who has an active lifestyle. Um, so we also um, uh, know that uh, I actually live uh, in the same town as Leslie, and uh, we live a couple miles apart. But in the mornings, at 6.30 in the morning, on a number of occasions, I'll see Leslie miles from her home, uh, walking her dog. Um, so she will be walking at 6.30 in the morning, bright, uh, cheerful, and um, the memento we put together. Uh -huh. <laughs> Come on up, Leslie. So we have a, a limited edition uh, fleece uh, embroidered with the gerontology program, <laughs> doctoral program in nice. gerontology. For you to wear on your dog walking. Thank you. And uh, preparing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In addition, oh. <laughs> also important with the doctoral program in gerontology. <laughs> you're you're out there to uh, enjoy your dog walking. Right. So good. It's good. Right and warm. So again, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> well, this concludes our program. Uh, I especially want to thank um, I want to thank everyone for being here, for everyone who's attended, took the time to attend. I want to thank uh, this wonderful tribute you gave to Leslie. I want to thank our faculty who were able to be here, um, who were at the beginning this department at UMBC and were able to share their perspective. I also want to um, make sure that we acknowledge the staff who really put this together. And Faith, uh, who, let's see, who else here? Is Trina here? Trina Torkelson, Kathy McDonald, I think she had to leave. Julie Rosenthal, is Julie here? Julie, Faith, or um, Julie, Yoon Lee, is Yoon Lee here? So some have left, but you guys have done a spectacular job. Thank you for making this a great success. So please continue. There's still some food. If you haven't signed up, please make sure you sign up so we know you attended this evening. And uh, please enjoy the rest of the evening.
Thank you.